I first met Ed Lucant 20 years ago. I uh, discovered uh, that while we were talking earlier, I was working down at uh, Clear Channel and uh, we had a whole bunch of Klotz consoles. And uh, Klotz, uh, I don't think they exist anymore, at least not in, in new condition. Uh, but the Klotz consoles were having all kinds of problems. And uh, they sent Ed out. And Ed started streaming Cat5 cable all over the building from each of the studios uh, back to the uh, uh, rack room and promptly discovered something that I hear uh, or heard was not uncommon. Uh, that being that the diskette that came from Klotz had viruses on it. And the, uh, was it Novell system, Ed? That, uh, it had was, yeah, at the time it was Novell, yep. 250 viruses. <laughs> and True. they wondered why yeah. the system didn't work. So. What, what was happening was really kind of weird. Um, whoever was the local somebody in there, they had... They had installed uh, or copied the CD to a PC that was the management PC, and they were plugging and unplugging it from the Internet. And every time they'd plug it into the Internet, all these viruses would start to essentially, you know, repopulate the clean system. And um, I spent, I think, three days just trying to get it all stable and trying to, out, where's the firewall? What do you need one of those for? We just plug it in. No, no, that's not how this works. I remember that well in all the uh, skipping over the cables in the hallway. So by now you've discovered we have Ed Bucant. Ed is going to talk to us about the Solderless Studio, and then we can discuss it. He's willing to take your questions. If you want to press your space bar or alternate A and uh, open your mic, and Ed will tell you what he thinks. Ed? So I guess I'm this is the part where I'm supposed to share the screen and see if it worked works as well now as it did in rehearsal. So we did that, and then we're going to try and start the slideshow and hope that this... There it is. I'm thinking hopefully everybody can see this. Yep. So I... You could lower is, your uh, microphone just a little bit to reduce the plosives. Okay, let me move that uh, over a little bit. Um, before we get to the technical part, this, this really starts out as a business thing. I, using structured wiring to build audio systems for radio and TV without soldering, crimping, or punching down wires. I got us a business case and then you know, why. Uh, I've been in this business uh, for 40 years, just turned 60 at the beginning of the year, and I find great wisdom in the phrase, if I had known I was going to live this long, I would have treated myself better when I was younger. You know, why, why do we do what we do and uh, incur you know, the, the consequences of it, whether it's repetitive motion injuries, burns of some sort uh, that might occur from soldering uh, of various types, uh, risk of fire or, or poisoning from um, solvents, solder, various things we do that involve that involve heat. Uh, a lot of this is you know, adverse to our health and the health of maybe everybody else in the building. Sometimes the vendors. You know, we're encouraged now to do things uh, in a more of a project manner: in scope, cost, uh, schedule, etc. And, and you're not going to do that if everything is just a, a one-off. Um, structure wiring all gives us the ability to reduce the risk of being off the air because we don't have the right connectors on, on hand at some point when we need them. And we're all trying to figure out how to get new blood into the business. Uh, having a standard wiring method for everything makes it easier to train or even cross-train other people. Uh, one example I like to use is you know, we're, we're one guy now, maybe to hear six stations. And especially if you're a music station, maybe there's some event in town that is going to have an act of some sort that you want to have in the studio. They show up for the morning show and you didn't know. 
Now you're trying to somehow get their piece of equipment, keyboard, mixer, you know, iPad, whatever, plugged into the console at the last minute. It's a lot easier if you could tell somebody in the promotion staff to go into the shop and pull out a bunch of pre-made adapters and plug them together with whatever Cat 5 patch cord they have lying around and you know, do all of that remotely, save the show, be the hero, and not have to go racing to the station for something that's not so much an engineering uh, challenge. Um, so I, you know, I'm trying to suggest that as engineers, technicians, managers, we can treat ourselves better, attract new talent, and contribute to the bottom line by looking at structured wiring technologies as a whole plant solution that can accommodate facility integration and orchestration with little or no soldering, punching down, or crimping of low voltage cabling. I, I do this fairly regularly, and uh, we're going to go into some of some of the ways that we uh, that we manage that. Um, the technical reasons that we may use a structure wiring approach, less variety and expensive tools. I, I have over three thousand dollars in different crimp tools, mostly associated with coax and various small wiring. But the tool we use the most now in, in, in modern facilities is the RJ45 crimper of some sort. Uh, you know, easy to make changes when you're using a structured wiring approach. You're, 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 if you're doing uh, multiple studios, multiple sites, maybe those are over multiple years, you, you come up with a plan that is repeatable, it is predictable, it is reliable. This stuff is very reliable uh, and is scalable. So the facility that you built now, you take out that spreadsheet, you buy the same adapters. You know, maybe you have somebody putting your your, your Cat Five wiring, uh, but there's lots of people doing that you know, fairly cheap. They do it every day, and, and you can accurately budget both your materials and your uh, labor. Uh, we've all been in facilities, I think, where over the course of several years, different. CD players, cart machines, you went from carts to CDs. You've got a string of six or seven adapters per machine in the back of the furniture because you had to get it on the air and you couldn't you know, resolder a connector because that would have meant taking the console off the air. We can get past all of that. You, can, you unplug the RJ45 from one adapter, plug it into the next one, and uh, there's, no, there's almost no downtime. Uh, a lot of this is common materials. The standard that, that I use, which started with Dan Braverman and, and Radio Systems, the Studio Hub, does follow uh, EIA TIA 568B. And uh, there are some other wiring standards out there. Uh, I, there are about five different approaches right now. At least one of the others is in the broadcast industry. Life safety has a version. Uh, paging and intercoms and such has a version. And uh, there are some others. But most of the broadcast world is following the 568B version that uh, Dan Braverman and uh, uh, Jeff DiPaolo first came up with. Uh, we find more and more products outside of broadcast are also adhering to this standard. You can buy video products with it um, again, faster, better, cheaper. And we're using the same wires for audio, for IP video, for data, and for control. So if you've wired 12 Cat 5s from your studios to your um, tech core, you, you can use them for whatever. So as, you know, today, maybe you've got audio over it. As something evolves, your needs evolve, you change a patch cord or a device, and now it's data. You went from analog audio to maybe AES-3 to audio over IP without pulling a different or another cable. Um, what we're looking at here is not necessarily IP. It can be used for that, but it is usually Ethernet. And the structured wiring approach, uh, some of the panels and such allow for snap-in devices 
that will accommodate a BNC or an F connector or whatever in the same uh, in, the, in the same physical uh, footprint. The idea is to have a common standard that meets the needs even as they change. So why do we want to look at doing this? You know, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, reports that in 2019, there were approximately 2.2 non-fatal injuries per 100 radio and TV employees. And 90% of those injuries resulted in days off with some percentage being permanent uh, transfer to another task, uh, job classification, or disability. It also indicates that there are approximately 26,000 employees uh, or people employed as radio and TV broadcast technical personnel, which works out to approximately 2% of the broadcast technical workforce is on leave from injury at any one time. For many facilities, the reality isn't 2%. It's 33, 50, 60, or 100% because the facility has only one, two, or none engineers on daily duty. If a single person is hurt, it can have an effect on the entire organization. So the idea is to go to methods like this that reduce the potential for injury and give us the ability to direct other people, whether it's an IT or uh, a contract or whatever, to do or assist us in doing what we do in the construction and uh, operation of plants. Yeah. Everything on this page is common off the shelf. Um, the, uh, the panels that are shown in particular, you can buy a 110 type punch down, but these, uh, if you know, traditionally we have had to have all of the furniture in place before we could do the wiring. But if you use a pre-made modular cable and these modular patch bays, you, you pull all of this early in construction and it's done. Or even if you pull bulk cable like this and you put the termination, you put a, a keystone on the end of the cable, like these keystones, the bulk wiring's done. The furniture comes in, drill a hole in the back, shove the wires through, and then you snap them all into the patch bay. You're, you are now running the train on the construction rather than being at the mercy of everybody else and you're trying to play catch up later in the process. And you can have all the rest of this. You can have figured out your patch cords ahead. Maybe you've even labeled everything. You, you can plug and play closer to the last minute uh, versus trying to play catch up amongst everybody else's delays. Lots more fiber being used. I did 21 studios with three guys in three days. We pulled all of the fiber across three three floors, terminated in, in a fiber version of this, all pre-made. There was no fiber cutting or splicing. And uh, you're, you're not gonna do that with copper in most cases. You know, fiber is a much, much better deal when you get into gigabits of data. So it, it can be cheaper than copper. There are various adapters. You can roll your own. Um, there, 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 are, there are, generally speaking, yes, the materials can cost a little more, but the labor savings can be substantial when you're, when you're trying to build. all kinds of ways of doing your audio. All of these are off the shelf products that you can buy so that you don't have to solder, punch or crimp. You know, we've got RJ45s to XLRs in both male and female versions, uh, tip ring sleeves. This is a pre-made adapter designed to plug into the back of a broadcast tools switcher. Uh, these are more of an off the shelf but I use these a lot to adapt satellite receivers to structured wiring. Um, this little guy does AES or mono audio, plug it directly into the device, and we and then a patch cord. We, we don't even have an intermediate cable. This cable and the one down here are basically similar things. You have a DB25 
that can plug into a device uh, with Tascam standard uh, eight channels of audio and bring it out to RJ45s or bring it out to XLRs in the event that you are trying to keep some analog legacy gear working at the same time that you are transitioning to uh, structured wiring. XLRs with screw terminals and uh, there's all sorts of versions of an RJ2 screw terminals out there. The, the important thing is to maintain the integrity of the twists in the pairs of wires because that's where your crosstalk performance is. Uh, I build facilities with lots of unshielded cable, even with 50 kilowatt AMs nearby, and I don't have interference problems because we, we have to respect the manner in which the wiring goes in. You're not going to be able to dress this uh, with all the wires running down a lacing bar and all brought out at 90 degree angles. You want the wiring to be loose and even maybe have some loops in it that will uh, encourage the common mode performance of the wiring. There, there does exist within this standard a 25 pair CAT 5E that terminates in a CAT 5 compliant connector and can be used with various panels to break out or convert. There is even an RJ45 patch bay and these little switches let you normalize or not the uh, connection. Now, all of the manner of building facilities that we're used to uh, can be supported in structured wiring. Um, just a variety of devices that now support the wiring standards, uh, broadcast tools, gates air, you know, telos, which if you, if you know the story from the construction of XM, uh, was a big jump on using this standard. The original Telos products had all XLRs, and in the course of participating in the XM project, uh, they saw what Dan Braverman was doing and pretty much scrapped the entire original line of classic nodes and went with RJ45s in them. Uh, this, this standard is now supported by Angry Audio. Because we have a wiring standard, uh, we can take products that, that don't know anything about structured wiring or Studio Hub or whatever, but plug an adapter on and turn these sorts of products into structured wiring compatible devices. And because they have network connections and this is a network standard, that same cable bundle could even bring your network connections back. Um, in that same vein, we have the ability to you know, have a device that doesn't have an analog I.O. or whatever. You might be able to plug in something like a Dante adapter. That'll give you a network connection. Now you can have that on the uh, a network version of this wiring. The ASI cards can be brought out to a Studio Hub version of the adapter. I think it's the model 1024. You, you can make an entire structured plane, even mic level signals. There are all sorts of pre-made mic to RJ45 or screw terminal adapters that you could drop into a, con a counter or something and get your mic level signals without having to uh, solder. The variety of adapters that let you go from RCA, SPIDF or whatever, up to the RJ45. The, the standard supports analog audio, AES3, and any networked uh, standard 10100, one gig. Um, there really isn't a 10G standard in this yet. You know, if you're if you're doing 10G, my experience so far is you're better off to do it on fiber. Copper on 10G, even if you buy all Cisco, is, is still not ready for prime time. These are some of the panels that RJ45 is used for the signal and power, and there are various mounts 
They give you, uh, make your own meter panels, switcher panels. I'm sure several people are familiar at least with the headphone panel and the various ways we can mount that. But these are all usable over the structured wiring uh, methodology. There are active, there's a switcher, there's a DA, hide them in the bottom of the rack somewhere. Uh, there are, are breakouts that allow traditional DAs to do the same. You know, I, why do we want to have this? This little picture here is an example. I got called to do an emergency visit. Uh, they lost their microphone in the control room. And uh, after digging around, I found these twisted wires. And it turned out that 15 years ago, they had a mic processor that used tip ring sleeve connectors. They kept replacing it. And one day they couldn't replace it. And because it didn't have XLRs, they couldn't plug it back to back either. So the engineer just cut the plugs off, twisted the wires together and shoved it in the furniture. And now they hired a DJ with long legs. He sat down, stretched out and wires were shorted together. Had that been a structured wiring device, it would have been very easy to change the adapters, put in a coupler, or whatever, and keep it all running instead of leaving a nightmare to show up years later. Um, that's 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 the brief version of the presentation. I'm I'm, you know, I'm open to what are your questions and concerns? To Cat Five or Fiber, do you recommend moving into Fiber or staying with Cat Five? The the makers of the systems and such, even even the folks at Audinate and Dante are talking about uh, fiber is inevitable. You know, if you when this all started in 2003, we still had a lot of analog and AES3 stuff. There wasn't that much networked audio yet. So we had to support traditional copper. Now, you know, so much of this is on the network. Your automation system, your audio consoles, it's all on the network. So when you start getting to be about more than roughly 250 streams at up to five mega stream, you are approaching the limit of a one gig connection. The next really, yeah, there's two and a half and 5G. And I consider those to be interme intermediate steps. The next step is 10G. If you're going to go to 10G to connect between two switches or another switch down the hall, I suggest copper. I, mean, I suggest fiber because copper, you know, the big disadvantage with copper is it does give you a voltage carrying path between rooms that could allow surges, maybe some form of ground loop or something that might be a problem. Uh, fiber can be cheap. You can get several hundred feet of fiber, uh, six strand fiber terminated in LC connectors with a pulling sock for a couple of hundred bucks. It's the same price as getting, uh, what, 12 pair audio to do the same thing. Generally, I would stick with copper within rooms and uh, fiber between switches if they're in different rooms, especially as you start approaching the limit of about you know, two or 300 uh, some odd feet. Um, but you know, again, your mileage may vary, um, but it is not uncommon to have over a gig of data running on an audio over IP network. And there are interfaces you could buy that would let you convert your audio, even if you're not doing a network in that sense and convert it to run over fiber. Of course, this is, uh, I suppose you would say, uh, along the lines of preference, but if you're going to run fiber to a switch in each studio, let's say, aren't you adding another A to D or D to A conversion in many cases? No, not really. I mean, it's just, it's just data. But in some cases, there is no A to D conversion. That's the beauty. If I've pulled my music library into my wide orbit system and I'm playing it out over uh, 
uh, an AOIP card, um, and I'm bringing it up on my my console, and then I'm uh, outputting that audio to my favorite audio processor that gives me uh, MPX over AES 192. I I've stayed in the digital domain the entire time with no you know, conversion from copper to fiber should have no impact on the audio at all. Uh, copper network into fiber network should, you know, the world runs on this stuff now. All of our Olympics are done on fiber. Interesting. Does uh, anyone have a, another question for Ed uh, in terms of solderless studios or what you found to work if you remember the very first picture he showed that's what doesn't work i have a few comments and questions be nice to talk it out i think it's useful for everyone yeah. hey ed um you didn't speak of these uh interfaces that you would have i'm actually having to learn about fiber and you know there's always going to be an interface and I'll give a great example uh, I've got to run fiber to a transmitter building mm -hmm. to uh, serve a multitude of uses IP just connection to the rest of our network audio and some control so I'm forgetting the name brand and the name of the device but hey, it pretty much looks like an old Interplex box that does just that. It breaks everything out. You buy the uh, device itself, and then you buy separately these cards as you need them. So everything you're talking about with fiber for audio, for broadcast engineers, radio and TV, you're going to, don't forget, you're going to have to learn more about these interfaces. They usually come with redundant power supplies. Do you have anything right. to add to that, Ed? There are several out there, and, and TV's been using that environment for a while. To radio, it's new. Yep. Uh, one that I'm familiar with is Barn Find, but there are others. And yes, uh, and the Barn Find stuff is nice, and it works, and it's pricey. But uh, I have uh, one station where uh, an electrical incident took out their $15,000 worth of legacy interplex. And we replaced that with $3,000 worth of new Interplex being the IPL 200. The IPL 200 has a provision to send uh, one network over the other, embeds your IP stream in with the other IP. Uh, we have two network connections coming off of that because in the Interplex, you, you have a main and a redundant. You can do that. And they are going into a card frame with uh, you know, Ethernet IP, so to speak, or Ethernet to fiber converters and single mode fiber. The frame does have uh, main and redundant supplies. The same thing at the other end. You know, we replaced the entire Interplex system. Uh, didn't pull any new wiring. We used all the fiber that was there, but that entire replacement cost us less than the original Interplex. And uh, yes, you know, there are, I don't know how many, there are lots of them out there. Um, I used the Fibox system back in 1996 for uh, Z104 in DC to get from the roof of the building uh, 14 stories down doing that. Uh, I have done fiber across campuses, including through way more patch cords than it should have taken between various closets and various buildings. Yeah, they, the technology, I think the solutions are there. They're just new to radio, but they have been used for quite a few years in audio in the pro AV world. Now, the Dallas Cowboys Stadium is one flat audio and video network with over 3,000 uh, TVs on that network and it all it's all got a master timing using the PTP Grandmaster and you know VLANs and everything else but it runs 
Got it. Um, two other comments. Uh, one time I was really hard pressed for mic level going into a device and I didn't really have an XLR cable, but I'm like, hey, I've got a bag filled with uh, Studio Hub connectors. So I did try that with the ethernet cable and uh, just fair warning to people, the lower uh, level audio can be problematic mic level. And would you agree with that, Ed? Yeah, I, yeah, the, the, the issue, the issue, well, there are a couple of issues. Uh, You're muted, Ed. Uh, you can press your space bar or what is it? All no, no, I should be unmuted now. Yep. Yes. The, the paper must have hit the space bar and I didn't realize it. Um, yeah, you, you know, the assumption is in a structured wiring environment, you, you shouldn't be having to run mic level very long distances. Uh, the assumption would be either we're going to put a preamp early on. Uh, now, I have used the Studio Hub adapter and a shielded patch cord that, to go into a, like an X-Node or something uh, successfully. But keeping a proper network cable with the, you know, the twists per inch, using Cat 5E or better, and probably a shielded patch cable uh, for mic level, yes, is important. Yeah. Hey, my final comment, do you have any tricks in dealing with Phoenix connectors? Because you showed some examples of Phoenix connectors or something um, related. And we all know, I remember in the 90s, they were a pain in the butt, but they are still with us today, and that's what makes uh, that part of a studio. It, um, it's interesting because the Phoenix connector is still with us in part because of the amount of AV business done in Las Vegas. Uh, I attended a seminar some years ago on where all this was going. And when Harmon started trying to connectorize all the stuff, you know, casinos spend more per casino per month than probably any of us can imagine just on changing shows. You know, we're talking several hundred thousand to several million dollars a month. And Harmon started connectorizing their products. And they saw their sales go down. Well, it turned out the AV integrators in Vegas were like, oh, no, 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 no. We get paid to wire this stuff. You make it so we still have something to wire. So in the pro AV world, there is still a lot of Phoenix connectors. The uh, I get uh, whatever you want to call it, a hockey puck, an RJ45, you know, telephone puck looking thing, and wire that out to a Phoenix connector, leaving yourself enough room for some cable dressing, maybe six inches or a foot. And that's how I adapt the um, Phoenix connectors to, or you could just use the Keystone Jack and punch the wires on it and then put them into the Phoenix. Yeah, there are, we call it hubifying it. Thanks for the presentation and answering my questions. Sure. Any other questions? Uh, Ed, do you want to put that very first picture back up for a second? Yeah, let me find the mouse and go. Here we go. Love it. Bert? I love it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, uh, I, I have been in facilities where someone tried their own version of structured wiring and then uh, I had to go through and, you know, correct it so we could actually, yeah, whatever, do the next phase of a project. Well, the <laughs> that is a very good point. That photo, the lady with the uh, solder iron is pretty much holding the tip. <laughs> and you don't solder on that side of the board. <laughs> she just needs to have on, you know, like an, an oven mitt or something. Um, <laughs> what well, we've all seen people using tools the way they thought was correct and they had no idea. 
Well, maybe she's hotter than the iron. But do yeah, you get the Will Smith award there. <laughs> if it smells like chicken, you're holding it wrong. That's right. <laughs> That's yep, yep, yep. Yeah, I was pretty uh, pretty stunned when I saw that the first time. Well, there is a, um, a, a, a large company that used to make audio consoles that still makes transmitters, uh, shipped a pre-wired package to a lobbying organization in D.C. that had a large IT department, and they, they said, you know, we, we, we can handle this. We know how to use a punch tool. We can put this studio together. And uh, several years later, they were still having issues with it. Uh, they brought an engineer in who didn't really have time to, to deal with it. He called me and said, you go there and look at it. And someone had used a greenie and a hammer to terminate all the wiring on a crone block because they didn't have the right crone tool. Yeah, that was a, uh, I'm sorry, but we need to start all over here, guys. <laughs> I have a similar story, if you can hear me. Yes, sir. Sure. Um, here in the Boston area, a manufacturer that was making a lot of consoles at the time and still makes transmitters, might have been the same one, also had installation kits for those consoles. And when they shipped them in, they had the ground connection and the, and the uh, minus connection for balanced audio reversed in all of the little connectors that plugged into the console. It took us three months to figure out why things didn't sound right and we had noise that we didn't expect to have. And when I contacted the manufacturer and I told them what was happening, they said, you're wrong. And I even sent them one of the cables and they still refused to pay attention to me until at an NAB convention, I ran into an RF engineer that worked for that company. And he threw his arm around my shoulder and he said, how come you don't buy stuff anymore from the company I work for? And I said, uh, let's not talk about this now. Let's go have a drink and I'll send you an email later tonight. And I created an email that was, uh, the title of it was Fool Me Four Times. And one of the four stories was that story. And the next day, he threw his arm around my shoulder and he says, I really understand how you feel. I don't blame you. Have a nice life. Uh, was this by any chance a small black connector with two rows of pins? A um, four connector? It, no, uh, no I, I, I don't want to talk. Uh, okay. You know, if you can't say anything good about somebody, I don't want to say okay. anything okay. Um, but um, um, it was individual connectors on individual modules that plugged into a console mainframe, but they oh. were tiny little connectors over underneath, like a, in the area where you would expect a meter bridge to be. We're talking 2000, we're talking about 1999, 2000. But okay. every one of their installation kits, I believe, was wired with <laughs> connected to the minus input of the amplifier and the um, and the minus output of an amplifier on an output connected to ground. So the outputs were driving ground. Yeah, seen I've seen that, and you're right. The manufacturers don't often realize because a lot of them are outsourcing as well. So they're not necessarily checking their vendor for the quality before they put their name on the box and send it to you. Well, I can say I've built several dozen studios in the last six years or so using structured wiring. And everything Ed says is completely true. The only soldering that we did was uh, 
soldering uh, microphone cables that went straight into uh, most of the stuff I did was uh, wheat net stuff. So I went into the straight into a blade or, or a mic pre. Uh, the only punching that we did was building custom ta tally systems that uh, just that seemed the, just the easiest way to do it uh, at the time. But practically everything else, uh, I know in uh, a big uh, studio complex in Boston, they pulled about 240,000 feet of Cat6 wiring into the rack room and out to the studios. And uh, it was a uh, click, and, click and plug from that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah it did, uh, I think WTMD, we pulled uh, over 45,000 feet. Well, we didn't actually have the IT contract. And this this is another sign of this. If you're in education or government and such, you can also use this to your advantage because they may already have a contractor who does all of their IT wiring. You go to that contractor to pull all of this. They may take your work, put it on another project, and maybe it doesn't even come out of your budget or it gets done faster because that contractor is already on site and is already under some contract to do all the work on the campus. And when you start using something like this, it changes your dynamics. I think the key that you focused on is, is a very good one, that this kind of wiring does cost a little more at front, but reduces the labor costs and makes it much simpler ongoing. My, my wife and I can do the structured wiring between six racks, buying all pre-made, uh, six cat sixes in a bundle, terminated, and buy, and buy the, uh, you know, the, the keystone panels. But we can put six racks together, uh, all their wiring between the racks, in an afternoon, two people on, on two ladders. You're not going to do a bunch of bulk wiring between racks any faster or cheaper doing it on your own. And, and some of the specifications, especially at CAT 6, only allow you to terminate in a keystone or a jack. You're not even supposed to make your own patch cords. You're, those are supposed to be factory certified uh, cabling. Very good. Anyone else have a comment or a question for Ed? Well, Ed, I should, well, yeah, I do. Um, what kind of uh, what what kind of RJ forty five connectors do you recommend? Any of any of the high quality ones? I I'm not a complete fan of the easy crimp uh, because yes, they're easier to crimp. But if you use them in a situation where there's going to be some exposure to the elements, uh, you've got a bare copper end that could corrode and, and build up, you know, various residue. But um, there are, you can go to Annexter, or, I mean, you can buy decent quality stuff on Amazon. Not as happy with mono price. But you can definitely get some decent stuff. Uh, all of the broadcast vendors will sell you, you know, decent brands. Uh, Accutech is probably the largest major supplier of materials. But I um, don't know that I would stick you know, with any particular one. Um, Tim says that he's had a few nightmares with easy 45s. Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised. Well, it's the same thing that he mentioned. You know, you've got, I mean, they're, they're I'll, I'll admit they're convenient. But at the same time, um, I found several where they haven't cut the ends out correctly and they're actually shorted or they're almost shorted. And... Uh, you know, we've had to trace those out and find them and just replace them. I don't use Easy's anymore. Can you ask? Me? 
Yeah, that. I mean, yes, that that can be a problem, but that kind of goes toward, to some degree, toward you know, a, a training and an approach. And actually, on that line, it's generally not a good idea to just cut the end off of a cable in this environment unless you know for sure what you've unplugged on the other end because uh, if that's into a PoE switch or maybe some version of a powered system that isn't PoE, uh, yeah, you're not going to get the typical nick in your pliers, but you're probably going to make something very unhappy at the other end. Uh, and in that same vein, the other thing you, if you're in a networked environment, um, and if you understand how network managers do security, if you have a piece of equipment and you're trying to pull an IP address and you plug it into a port and you don't get an address, it's not a good idea to go to the next port because there's probably a security policy that if it doesn't recognize the MAC address, it's going to shut the port down. And if you keep going down the switch looking for an IP address, you will lock out the switch. Been there, done that. <laughs> in the in this case, it did take out the PoE. Yeah, yeah. and the whole thing was ugly. Yeah, because forty eight volts with with uh, not always very much in the way of current uh, protection. Because you're allowed what up to thirteen watts now. I think it is over the connection. Yeah, oh. these were the cameras. These were the outdoor cameras with mm -hmm. Cat Five, and and they used the Easies, and they shorted the whole thing out. And we had I had to go in and clean yeah. it all up. Yeah. I, I realize I didn't really. I should have had a slide in here showing how the the standard, so to speak, wires out. Um, there are four pairs: orange, green, blue, and brown. Uh, Typical Cat5. We use the first pair, the orange pair, is our left channel or AES. The green pair is the right channel. The blue pair is uh, more or less for ground and, and maybe some additional whatever. And then the brown pair is uh, power uh, in the standard. Yeah, they pretty much took a uh, four-pair connector uh, uh, with um, with the bell uh, with the bell practices, their standard, and what they did was they modified it with the uh, with the B to bring um, the orange and white to what we consider pa pair one now. All right. Okay. You know, and if for, for for those who are interested in, there's there is a reason that B is the standard and not uh, 568A. Yeah, if you go back to the way we used to do things, you had the, uh, the origin equipment and the terminal equipment, and you would put a null modem cable between them. Well, the way the equipment is actually manufactured is to uh, remove the need to make crossover cables. Your switches are actually wired 568A. Everything else is wired 568B. So when you put in a standard patch cord, the twist is already there. And what we call a crossover cable actually undoes the switch being an A-style connector. So we don't have to worry about making null modem cables any longer. That, that can sometimes trip you up if you have switches at each end uh, and you're patching between them. Yeah. But MIDIX automatically detecting usually solves that, unless you've got SFPs in there and then sometimes all bets are off. Well, Ed, I sure want to thank you for your presentation and answering the questions okay. and not chasing you away, but really want to appreciate this and invite you back another time. I, uh, you know, email with questions. I'm uh, been practicing this now for close to 20 years. <laughs>